An Adventure in the Upper Sea by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I am a retired captain of the Upper Sea. That is to say, when I was a younger man, which is not so long ago, I was an aeronaut and navigated that aerial ocean which is all around about us and above us. Naturally, it is a hazardous profession, and naturally I have had many thrilling experiences, the most thrilling, or at least the most nerve-wracking, being the one I am about to relate. It happened before I went in for hydrogen gas balloons, all of varnished silk, doubled and lined and all that, and fit for voyages of days instead of mere hours. The little NASA, named after the great NASA of many years back, was the balloon I was making the sense in at the time. It was a fair-sized hot air affair, of single thickness, good for an hour's flight or so, and capable of attaining an altitude of a mile or more. It answered my purpose, for my act at the time was making half-mile parachute jumps at recreation parks and county fairs. I was in Oakland, a California town, filling the summer's engagement with a street railway company. The company owned a large park outside the city, and of course it was to its interest to provide attractions which would send the townspeople over its line when they went out to get a whiff of country air. My contract called for two ascensions weekly, and my act was an extremely taking feature, for it was on my days that the largest crowds were drawn. Before you can understand what happened, I must first explain a bit about the nature of the hot air balloon, which is used for parachute jumping. If you have ever witnessed such a jump, you will remember that directly the parachute was cut loose, the balloon turned upside down, emptied itself of its smoke and heated air, flattened out and fell straight down, beating the parachute to the ground. Thus there is no chasing a big deserted bag for miles and miles across the country, and much time, as well as trouble, is thereby saved. This maneuver is accomplished by attaching a weight, at the end of a long rope, to the top of the balloon. The aeronaut, with his parachute and trapeze, hangs to the bottom of the balloon, and, weighing more, keeps it right side down. But when he lets go, the weight attached to the top immediately drags the top down, and the bottom, which is the open mouth, goes up, the heated air pouring out. The weight used for this purpose on the little NASA was a bag of sand. On the particular day I have in mind there was an unusually large crowd in attendance, and the police had their hands full keeping the people back. There was much pushing and shoving, and the ropes were bulging with the pressure of men, women, and children. As I came down from the dressing room I noticed two girls outside the ropes, of about fourteen and sixteen, and inside the rope a youngster of eight or nine. They were holding him by the hands, and he was struggling, excitedly and half in laughter, to get away from them. I thought nothing of it at the time, just a bit of childish play, no more, and it was only in the light of after events that the scene was impressed vividly upon me. "'Keep them cleared out, George,' I called to my assistant. "'We don't want any accidents.' "'Aye,' he answered. "'That I will, Charlie.' George Guppy had helped me in no end of a sense, and because of his coolness, judgment, and absolute reliability, I had come to trust my life in his hands with the utmost confidence. His business it was to overlook the inflating of the balloon, and to see everything about the parachute was in perfect working order. The little NASA was already filled and straining at the guys. The parachute lay flat along the ground and beyond it the trapeze. I tossed aside my overcoat, took my position, and gave the signal to let go. As you know, the first rush upward from the earth is very sudden, and this time the balloon, when it first caught the wind, heeled violently over and was longer than usual in riding. I looked down at the old familiar sight of the world rushing away from me. 
and there were the thousands of people, every face silently upturned. And the silence startled me, for, as crowds went, this was the time for them to catch their first breath and send up a roar of applause. But there was no hand clapping, whistling, cheering, only silence. And instead, clear as a bell and distinct, without the slightest shake or quaver, came George's voice through the megaphone. Ride her down, Charlie! Ride the balloon down! What had happened? I waved my hand to show that I had heard and began to think. Had something gone wrong with the parachute? Why should I ride the balloon down instead of making the jump which thousands were waiting to see? What was the matter? And as I puzzled, I received another start. The earth was a thousand feet beneath, and yet I heard a child crying softly, and seemingly very close to hand. And though the little Nasa was shooting skyward like a rocket, the crying did not grow fainter and fainter and die away. I confess I was almost on the edge of a funk, when, unconsciously following up the noise with my eyes, I looked above me and saw a boy astride the sandbag which was to bring the little Nasa to earth. And it was the same little boy I had seen struggling with the two girls, his sisters, as I afterward learned. There he was, astride the sandbag and holding on to the rope for dear life. A puff of wind healed the balloon slightly, and he swung out into space for ten or a dozen feet, and back again, fetching up against the tight canvas with a thud which even shook me, thirty feet or more beneath. I thought to see him dashed loose, but he clung on and whimpered. They told me afterward how, at the moment they were casting off the balloon, the little fellow had torn away from his sisters, ducked under the rope, and deliberately jumped astride the sandbag. It has always been a wonder to me that he was not jerked off in the first rush. Well, I felt sick all over as I looked at him there, and I understood why the balloon had taken longer to right itself, and why George had called after me to ride her down. Should I cut loose with the parachute, the bag would at once turn upside down, empty itself, and begin its swift descent. The only hope lay in my riding her down, and in the boy holding on. There was no possible way for me to reach him. No man could climb the slim, closed parachute, and even if a man could, and made the mouth of the balloon, what could he do? Straight out, and fifteen feet away, trailed the boy on his ticklish perch, and those fifteen feet were empty space. I thought far more quickly than it takes to tell all this, and realized on the instant that the boy's attention must be called away from his terrible danger. Exercising all the self-control I possessed, and striving to make myself very calm, I said cheerily, Hello, up there. Who are you? He looked down at me, choking back his tears and brightening up, but just then the balloon ran into a cross-current, turned half around and lay over. This set him swinging back and forth, and he fetched the canvas another bump. Then he began to cry again. "'Isn't it great?' I asked heartily, as though it was the most enjoyable thing in the world, and without waiting for him to answer, "'What's your name?' "'Tommy Dermot,' he answered. "'Glad to make your acquaintance, Tommy Dermot,' I went on. "'But I'd like to know who said you could ride up with me.' He laughed and said he just thought he'd ride up for the fun of it. And so we went on, I sick with fear for him, and cudgeling my brain to keep up the conversation. I knew that it was all I could do, and that his life depended upon my ability to keep his mind off his danger. I pointed out to him the great panorama spreading away to the horizon and four thousand feet beneath us. There lay San Francisco Bay like a great placid lake, the haze of smoke over the city, the Golden Gate, the ocean fog rim beyond, and Mount Tamalpais over all, clear-cut and sharp against the sky. Directly below us I could see a buggy, apparently crawling, but I knew from experience that the men in it were lashing the horses on our trail. But he grew tired of looking around, and I could see he was beginning to get frightened. "'How would you like to go in for the business?' I asked. 
He cheered up at once and asked, Do you get good pay? But the little Nasa, beginning to cool, had started its long descent and ran into countercurrents which bobbed it roughly about. This swung the boy around pretty lively, smashing him into the bag once quite severely. His lip began to tremble at this, and he was crying again. I tried to joke and laugh, but it was no use. His pluck was oozing out, and at any moment I was prepared to see him go shooting past me. I was in despair. Then, suddenly, I remembered how one fright could destroy another fright, and I frowned up at him and shouted sternly, You just hold on to that rope. If you don't, I'll thrash you within an inch of your life when I get you down on the ground. Understand? Y y yes sir, he whimpered, and I saw that the thing had worked. I was nearer to him than the earth, and he was more afraid of me than of falling. Why, you've got a snap up there on that soft bag, I rattled on. Yes, I assured him. This bar down here is hard and narrow, and it hurts to sit on it. Then a thought struck him, and he forgot all about his aching fingers. When are you going to jump? he asked. That's what I came up to see. I was sorry to disappoint him, but I wasn't going to make any jump. But he objected to that. It said so in the papers, he said. I don't care, I answered. I'm feeling sort of lazy today, and I'm going to ride down the balloon. It's my balloon, and I guess I can do as I please about it. And anyway, we're almost down now. And we were, too, and sinking fast. And right there and then that youngster began to argue with me as to whether it was right for me to disappoint the people and to urge their claims upon me. And it was with a happy heart that I held up my end of it, justifying myself in a thousand different ways, till we shot over a grove of eucalyptus trees and dipped to meet the earth. Hold on tight, I shouted, swinging down from the trapeze by my hands in order to make a landing on my feet. We skimmed past a barn, missed a mesh of clothesline, frightened the barnyard chickens into a panic, and rose up again clear over a haystack, all this almost quicker than it takes to tell. Then we came down in an orchard, and when my feet had touched the ground I fetched up the balloon by a couple of turns of the trapeze round an apple tree. I have had my balloon catch fire in mid-air, I have hung on the cornice of a ten-story house. I have dropped like a bullet for six hundred feet when a parachute was slow in opening. But never have I felt so weak and faint and sick as when I staggered towards the unscratched boy and gripped him by the arm. Tommy Dermot, I said when I had got my nerve back somewhat. Tommy Dermot, I'm going to lay you across my knee and give you the greatest thrashing a boy ever got in the world's history. No, you don't, he answered, squirming around. You said you wouldn't if I held on tight. That's all right, I said, but I'm going to just the same. The fellows who go up in balloons are bad, unprincipled men, and I'm going to give you a lesson right now to make you stay away from them and from balloons too. And then I gave it to him, and if it wasn't the greatest thrashing in the world, it was the greatest he ever got. But it took all the grit out of me, left me nerve-broken, that experience. I cancelled the engagement with the street railway company, and later on went in for gas. Gas is much the safer, anyway. End of An Adventure in the Upper Sea Read by Tom Crawford, February 2010